Um, we're right about at 100, and there's about 60 more people who are going to join us. I've, I just introduced myself to most of you. I'm Laura Mogul, Executive Director of Landmark on Main Street. It is my great pleasure to welcome everyone to the first event in our new Climate Action Series, which is a conversation with Corinna Gore. This series was developed in partnership with Transition Town Port Washington, and we want to express our deep appreciation to the organization and especially to uh, Hilda Powell's daughter, Margaret Galbraith and Claire Treves Brazel, who were the driving force behind bringing this all together. And you'll be hearing more from Hilda as we get underway. For Landmark, the series is the latest of our conversations for Main Street programs to explore the critical issues about climate and the environment. A huge shout out goes to Kelly Rents Bruneau, our manager of community affairs, who develops and produces Landmark's community programs, including conversations from Main Street and to our intrepid tech director, Sean Perry. So thank you both from, from Landmark. As we begin, I want to acknowledge the elected officials who are joining us here tonight. This series is about thinking globally and acting locally, and we are gratified that our government representatives share our concerns. So we have with us tonight, New York State Assemblywoman, Gina Salitti, North Hampstead Town Supervisor, Judy Bosworth, North Hempstead Town Clerk, Wayne Wink, and representing North Hempstead Councilwoman, Marianne Dalmonte, we have Erin Molyneux. So thank you all for joining us tonight. So Hilder Powell's daughter, Hilder is a member of the Transition Town Port Washington Steering Committee. She is co-founder of Rewild Long Island and president of the Board of Trustees of the Science Museum of Long Island. She's also the co-founder of the Saul Center in, P in Port Washington. Those are just her basically environmental credentials. She is so much more. Hilda lives at the intersection of science and spirituality. She's a passionate believer and a successful advocate for both. And we are so pleased to welcome her once again to guide our conversation here tonight. Hilda, all yours. Well, I would like to thank you, Laura. It's really uh, amazing, wonderful to be here. And um, I am here at the Landmark Theater. And I, I, that's why it looks sort of spooky behind me. <laughs> and, uh, but I'm sitting here alone this time uh, and staring at an empty audience. And I would like to reframe that situation already. Um, with gratitude for us being able to gather in this way when we can't meet in person. So uh, as we get to our um, purpose for being here, climate resilience, reframing the climate crisis, I can't think of a better person uh, to be with than Karana Gore. And uh, I did already, but you may have entered um, after the fact, but I wanted to really thank everyone for taking the time to be with us here tonight. Uh, I know we're uh, spending a lot of our time in virtual spaces and it, it's a big um, effort on your side to take this time at 7.30 on a Thursday night. And I'm representing Transition Town, Port Washington. So with uh, Transition Town is part of a global network. You can uh, find this on uh, transitiontownpw.org. And we'll, we're hosting this um, series. It's a climate action series. It's uh, the time to step into action is now. And uh, we uh, are part of a movement that is aiming to cut greenhouse gases where we can and um, divest or move away from fossil fuels and towards renewables in any which way we can. So that's, uh, that's the purpose, if you were wondering what uh, transition town per se, that is a, a, global, a global movement. And I wanna first and foremost, thank our distinguished guest, my friend, Ms. Karen Gore, for giving us your time and all my co-conspirators at Transition Town for the work that went into preparing this. Um, I would like to start by uh, just asking you to mark your calendars every other Thursday night uh, because we have created this program with, uh, there is a, a, a little bit of thinking that went into it. 
and I promise it to be worthy of your time and we'll try to commit the content to an hour or so, so that you keep coming. We may go into overtime if you're willing to stay with us. First, a few technical notes. You can connect with Kelly and Margaret in the chat. It's set to host right now. So I ask that you don't uh, chat with me directly, but find them in the chat uh, as I will be concentrating on um, my conversation with Karenna. And in order to keep the culture of presentation in person, we've limited the chat to host only. We will open up the chat in about I would say halfway through our com uh, conversation to open it up to the interactive part, the fun part where we get to hear from you. And, um, and we will then see where the conversation leads us. If we don't get to your question and you're getting frustrated, please know that throughout this series and beyond this series, you can reach us through transitiontownpw.org. There is a way to leave your questions, concerns, comments um, through the website. And we're here really to set the stage for an ongoing community conversation. This is the first of many. Uh, if you feel strongly about transitioning our community towards renewables, then please join us and become an active member. Uh, there is a lot of work to do. And I'd like to start, before we move on to the conversation with Karana, I'd like to start with a respectful pause to acknowledge all those who are uh, struggling right now to stay physically or mentally healthy in this difficult time. The pandemic is real and so is climate change. There are many parallels between the public response to COVID and climate change. I'm sure we'll get into that. And before we do that, it is my great joy to introduce a true leader in the environmental and social justice movement, Ms. Karana Gore. Karana's journey is inspiring, and to me, she, she embodies resilience. She started as a journalist and worked as an attorney. Now she is a director of Center for Earth Ethics, a published author, educator, spiritual activist, community organizer, and a mother of three. Her achievements are too many to share here, but I'll briefly mention that with a BA in history and literature uh, from Harvard, she went on to receive a law degree. She worked actively on her father, Al Gore's 2000 presidential campaign. The results of that election not only uh, changed her life, but changed the course of my life for sure. And the history of not just the US, but perhaps the world. In 2006, she wrote, uh, she published a book worthy of your attention, Lighting the Way, Nine Women Who Shaped Modern America. And in 2013, graduated from Union Theological Seminary, after which she founded the Center for Earth Ethics. And as I said, I can't think of a better way to address the climate resilience and reframe the climate crisis than with you, Karena. I wanted to start our conversation with um, how we went from global warming to climate change, but now we're in a crisis. Some may even say we're uh, living a climate emergency. Some will frame it that way. So how did we get here? That's a, a loaded question to get us started. Well, thank you so much, Hildur. I am really honored and, and quite moved uh, to be in this conversation for several reasons. Um, one is that um, you and I first connected at a minister's training that um, Center for Earth Ethics did at Union Theological Seminary, where we're based a few years ago. And I know that you are a, a person of great depth um, who thinks about, is a scientist thinking about science and also um, practice a, a kind of ministry to so many people, individuals and community. Uh, and I am, I'm just very, I feel blessed by, by our friendship. And I'm also um, particularly honored uh, by this because I, I have so much respect for this community coming together, this very serious series that you all have um, have forged uh, is is one that I intend to to attend all of the all of the talks and um, 
to be engaged going forward with how you all are thinking this through. It's clear that uh, that this is this is about um, not only the sort of conceptual theoretical conversations, but also very practical um, uh, considerations about how how we make changes. Um, I want to thank the landmark on Main Street and Transition Town, Port Washington, especially, um, and uh, just say how excited I am and honored. And please um, feel free to go if you want to know more about Center for Earth Ethics. Um, we have our website, centerforearthethics.org, and you can sign up for our newsletter if you're interested. Um, and you can always email info at centerforearthethics.org if you have any follow-up question for me. Um, with that said, I uh, will answer your question, how did we get here? It's a big one. And it's interesting how you framed it because you talked about the way that the language has changed. And I think that that is indeed very interesting. Um, I, I grew up around conversations uh, around global warming because my father, um, who was uh, in the House of Representatives and then in the United States Senate before he became uh, vice president, um, he was very interested in this topic, having had a professor actually in college, who, who Roger Revelle, who taught it. And so he um, was one of those who convened the first hearings, congressional hearings on um, global warming. So I was around, around these conversations growing up. I myself didn't go into this work actually in a personal way until much later, until I was at Union um, Seminary in, uh, in 2014. Um, so not even that long ago, uh, and I can I can touch on why that is um, in a moment. But it's true that um, it was called global warming. We heard about the greenhouse effect, um, the 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 idea that we have this. Although the sky looks limitless from down here, it's a thin shell that traps um, these gases like a greenhouse does, and. Um, then it became uh, known as climate change and, and now climate crisis. I think all of the language that we have to, to describe this is kind of inadequate because it feels so, it can feel quite flat. Um, and it almost sometimes reinforces this sense that human beings are separate from nature, that it's some kind of backdrop. Even when we talk about environmental or environmentalism, sometimes it seems as if that's a backdrop. Um, when really, of course, we're talking about our, our bodies are uh, completely intertwined, the air in our lungs, the water we drink, the food that comes from the soil, um, the iron in our blood, and, and so on. Um, this, is, this is what we are, we are really talking about. And the moral and spiritual dimensions of this, um, what we now uh, most refer to as climate crisis, um, are, are very uh, deep indeed. Um, how we got here, I think it's important to say there are two megatrends. Um, there is depletion and pollution. So the depletion being um, deforestation, the stripping of soils and wetlands and so on, a lot of that comes from um, what we think of as economic development. So um, some of it, it will be agricultural. Um, some of it is, is very explicitly industrial. And, uh, and we know that, that what's happening is we're, um, we're taking away these, what we refer to as natural resources at a faster rate than they can be replenished. So the earth is resilient, but only within a, a balance. And we've disrupted that balance. And so the depletion um, is relevant for many reasons. Of course, this is habitat for animals, um, habitat for people too. Um, but also it's carbon sinks. So the balance of, of, of how carbon goes into the air is disrupted by the depletion of the carbon sinks of these forests and, and so on. And then the other megatrend of pollution um, is obviously what we refer to as greenhouse gases. So the primary cause of, of cl the climate crisis is the burning of fossil fuels, the oil, coal, and gas um, that goes into the atmosphere. And that the, these two things combined, um, obviously this all uh, really sped up in the industrial revolution. And um, the, the, the value system, the, the perception um, of humanity's relationship to the rest of the natural world was really uh, had an outsized 
it, it was it was influenced in an outsized way by American culture because of that time um, of American ascendancy in the world. And uh, so that's one reason why I think we here um, have a really special responsibility uh, and opportunity to grapple with our own lives and our own culture um, and, and point of reference in order to, to be a part of the, the solution, which um, must happen because what is, what is uh, at stake is ultimately um, the survival of human life on Earth, if this trajectory were to continue unchecked. But it's not just fear of, of death um, or, or fear of extinction that drives um, this movement for sustainability. It's also quality of life. I think many people are now understanding um, that there, there are ways in which if we reconnect, if we live in balance, we can have a higher quality of life for the whole, and particularly also for those who have been um, borne the brunt because the pollution and the depletion do not affect all equally. So of course there there are there is racism involved, there's injustice involved there that we have an opportunity to correct too. So thank you so much for that for that broad opening question. Um, Hilder. Yeah, I'm actually I'm tempted to bring up a couple of um, examples of how you have applied yourself in uh, uh, as an activist, as a climate activist, I, I am wondering if it's okay with you that I share those pictures now that show um, the extent, um, you know, we, we do have to step up now. We have the technology, renewables are here, the technology is here. Uh, 10 years ago, um, you know, wind and solar were seen as sort of, you know, yeah, great idea, but not practical. Now it's it's perfectly feasible. Our electric bill, uh, we we installed solar panels, so we're we're just leasing them right now. But the numbers were just uh, it's really satisfying to see the greenhouse gas emissions were not uh, causing with the way we power our houses. And I know uh, Biden now is as uh, a very um, is committed. He he's uh, stated that he wants to decarbonize the power grid by two, 2035. And I know that you have basically done the groundwork, literally laid yourself on the ground. And I'm going to pull up that slide because that shows to our audience who you are, uh, because you can speak as eloquently uh, in 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 ter in terms of legislation and and law, but you also are out there standing with those who need standing with. Standing at Standing Rock, and um, if everybody bears with me, I just want to bring that up because um, your your journey is is inspiring, and the work you do in the world is from um, the White House to standing with uh, our leaders in the climate movement, standing at Standing Rock. I believe this picture is uh, with. Wait, uh, thank you, thank you, Hilda, and I can give some context. I was um, for those that 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 don't know, Standing Standing Rock um, was the conflict a few years ago with the Dakota Access Pipeline, oil pipeline going through um, the the lands of the Standing Rock Sioux tribe and they resisted um, that oil pipeline. It was supposed to go by Bismarck, um, but people were worried about an oil spill. So they put it through by the Native American um, community through their sacred land, which is of course a classic example of environmental injustice. Um, and then uh, in fact, the Standing Rock uh, Sioux and their allies created a big prayer camp um, which became known as Standing Rock, in which um, mainly there were indigenous people from all over the world and then also allies who were non-indigenous that came together in a peaceful non-violent prayer camp to resist the Dakota Access Pipeline. And I was able to go there. Um, and one of the things that was so powerful about it was that they changed the language around um, around what what we was happening there. Because a lot of times you all might have noticed there's a kind of culture war um, uh, that that gets whipped up around, you know, that, that environmentalists are just angry protesters. And um, what people at Standing Rock said was, we are not protesters, we're protectors. We're water protectors. And we're defending the sacred. And that really, I think, changed the climate movement in a certain way. So this photograph is actually not from Standing Rock, it's from, it's from Manhattan. 
um, where uh, with indigenous allies um, and others, we were asking for um, the, the city to divest from the pipeline, from um, to, to divest all of the pension funds from um, where they would be supporting the Dakota As Access Pipeline. So that's that's what that action is from. But thank you so much, Hilda, and yes. thank you for, for putting the slides. I know it's not easy to do it, and I hope people enjoy seeing some images. Yes, and I, I actually want to speak to that action point that we can actually all make sure our if, uh, pension funds, uh, where is the investment? Right now, you can divest away from fossil fuels and invest in renewables. And there's a new term on Wall Street, uh, SEG, I believe I'm, I'm, I'm saying it correctly, social environmental governance. Uh, this is something that is an immediate action point. If you don't have your own personal funds to divest uh, and, and invest in the right things, that's, it's very important for many reasons. And maybe you want to speak to this particular story here, Karen. Sure. Yeah, and I want to add about the divestment because I do think that's a really powerful tool for people to know about. Even before you make the decision to pull your money or your the institution you're affiliated with, whether it's your church or your school or whatever it is, you can ask the question. You can just let them know, uh, let the bank know that you care um, or let your uh, investment um, man portfolio manager, whoever it is, let them know that you care. Ask the question about whether they're invested in um, fossil fuels, because I think that the more people hear that this is a, an area of concern, the more things are shifting in the other way. And by the way, it's good business now as well, because um, because although this industry is trying to hold on, it is going the other way. We must change and the world is, is going to be changing. So thank you. And for this, um, thank you, Hildur. This is this happened a few years ago. I was I, I have had um, I, I, at Union Seminary, um, where the Center for Earth Ethics is based, had a lot of occasion to think about the civil rights movement because where we are, um, it is really revered as a, an example of where um, religion was a force for good, that um, Martin Luther King Jr. and others in the movement drew deeply from uh, sacred scriptures and, and um, Bible stories in order to communicate on a deeper level about why um, segregation had to end, about why racial violence had to end, um, and um, also the practical reach of, of, of the, the faith communities for organizing was very important in the civil rights movement in churches um, and, and synagogues and other uh, houses of worship was a lot of times where people met in order to plan the marches uh, that really define the civil rights movement. And another aspect of the civil rights movement was nonviolent civil disobedience. Mm -hmm. And I think an important thing to think about with ethics is that there are times when a deep sense of right and wrong is out of step with laws and with social norms. So that the work of the movement is to kind of show that the laws themselves are unjust. So that is like the lunch counter sit-ins, um, the freedom rides, and King himself, having been to jail many times, wrote the beautiful letter from a Birmingham jail um, explaining why sometimes in a way that is very transparent and is very not obviously nonviolent, nonviolent, nonviolence being a very active thing in the way that Gandhi taught um, as uh, when he was articulating uh, ahimsa um, and Satyagraha, uh, the, the nonviolence and the truth force that was part of his movement, which of course influenced King. So I was thinking about what would be the, the corollary in the climate movement um, to that type of action. And of course, there are many people who have been thinking along those lines. And there were people who um, were thinking about uh, stopping these pipelines. So this the action that I did um, was in Boston. Um, it was a fracked gas pipeline. And uh, there were a few things about it that made it, uh, that called me to it. It's the only time that I have been, um, that I have done a nonviolent civil disobedience um, action and been arrested. Um, the reason why I felt this one was important was that the way the action, well, first, let me say, this is an example of, of a project in which the, um, the, 
every the whole community was against it. The city of Boston was litigating against the pipeline. This was a case of um, of, of federal government, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, known as the FERC, had approved the pipeline and it was being forced through. And the way that that had, had happened in the in the regulatory process um, was influenced by the money and the backroom deals and so on. So it felt very unjust in the sense of how democracy should function, that these people who didn't want this pipeline in their community, the city that was suing, why should they be putting it in? It wasn't necessary. It was for profits uh, for private corporations. Um, and so uh, the other thing about this particular action was that it, there were uh, there was an interfaith group that had um, decided to come together and make a um, a kind of point of two things. One, um, having having a, a communal involvement that 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 included thinking about people that were dying of climate impacts. So in this particular case, and I think you might have showed the poster um, before this one, uh, there was a, a heat wave in Pakistan that year in which um, hundreds of people died. And there was a mass grave that was dug for the bodies because this was, and this was very unusual to have this high heat wave with that many people dying. And um, a friend of mine who had, um, organized this, saw that picture of the mass grave and said, that looks like the pipeline trench. Mm -hmm. And so we laid down in the pipeline trench and beforehand, we sort of invoked the fact that we we're calling for people to recognize the connection. One thing about the moral the dimension of climate change that people people sometimes call it like the a wicked problem or, or, or a, a kind of perfect moral storm of a problem because you can't quite pinpoint sometimes cause and effect. Um, we're talking about moral obligations across time yeah. and across space. And yeah. so this was one in which we, we, we tried to make that point. Yeah, you've spoken of the climate crisis as a, a symptom of mor moral bankruptcy, really. And, and we, uh, in an instant gratification culture that worships economic growth and actually relies on finite resources to fuel infinite growth, uh, that is insanity. <laughs> <laughs> my definition of insanity. And I think a big part of the problem is the way we measure what's of value to us, the GDP. We've talked about that. And we've talked about what a reformed value system would look like. So if we were to maybe speak to that in terms of, um, I, I know we've had that conversation, what would be a better indicator for um, you know, what, what is well-being, you know, where, where and, and if we are to, you know, we may be well off here uh, for now, not forever, um, but we have responsibility, and that's an indigenous view, again, the seven generations, to be able to relate across time and space, but we have responsibility today as I uh, live in a world where I can't help but uh, cause emissions, other people and typically marginalized communities or, or with less means are paying the price first. We will all be affected in the, in the long run. So um, perhaps if we speak to what could, you know, I've, I'm always, I've been fascinated by this because I know New Zealand and Bhutan and other places are experimenting with GDP in different ways. And when the WHO, uh, states that the leading cause for disability worldwide is depression, right? So mm -hmm. wouldn't it make sense to bring a sense of well-being if, 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 for instance, uh, pollution or, or mental health or uh, social uh, and environmental justice was brought into the value system? Yes. No, thank you. I, for me, this was, this was one of these aha moments when I, um, it was explained to me and I, I learned about a GDP, gross domestic product, or sometimes called GNP, gross national product, as a, um, as a measurement. So I guess because I, I also, I grew up around politics and I tune in a lot to politics. And of course, economic growth is um, held up as the ultimate uh, concern, you know, when, um, Paul Tillich, who is a, a, an ethicist and a scholar of religion, would say that religion is really about the ultimate concern. And, um, 
in our society, it does seem to me that that is consistently lifted up as the main thing, the moral mandate. And when you look at the way that it's measured, it's it's measured primarily by this measurement GDP. Um, and the man who uh, invented it, uh, Simon Kuznets, um, who ended up winning the Nobel Prize in economics, said at the time, please do not use this as a, as a measure of the well-being of, of how healthy your society is. Please don't do that because it won't do it. It doesn't count key things. So what it doesn't count um, is pollution and depletion, those two mega trends that we talked about. Um, it also doesn't count inequality so that, you know, the GDP can go way up, but there can be more poverty, more people living in poverty, and it's only the wealth is in the hands of a few. And finally, it doesn't count the positive long-term effects of investments in community and culture in protecting a forest rather than um, chopping it down to turn it into products and so on. So um, it does seem to me very important to change that that measurement. And as you say, there's a lot of work being done on that. In Bhutan, they, they, they in the 70s, started gross national happiness. And um, it might've been later, but I think they were talking about it from way back then. And uh, there's a long questionnaire. There's also the Human Development Index, HDI. There's something called the Happy Planet Index. There are many people working on it. Usually they'll take a factor like life expectancy um, and add it in, and sometimes biodiversity or ecological factors to add in um, to a measurement. And obviously this is a science to get, to get uh, these measurements correct, but it seems to me like it's very important on that level and it's important on the level of our discourse. Just like when we talk about money, I mean, we confuse money with, vir with virtue or goodness a lot. You know, we'll say like, this person is worth this much or, this person did really, really well when all we mean is that they made a lot of money. And, and that's also perverse. You know, there are people who are living such um, dignified, wonderful, giving, uh, valuable lives who aren't focused on making money. And we know that instinctively, but we still kind of allow the language to grow in the same way that we know instinctively that there's something wrong with how we're on our trajectory in our society. We know it, but it keeps going because we've set the measurements that way. So I think we have this wonderful opportunity to change. And, and I appreciate, Hildur, that you're focused on that. Yes, and I, I, as this is a conversation, I think we should start including the audience. Uh, I have a question that came in by email from Heinz Eufer. I believe that pursuing a daily mindful practice, practice does indeed affect personal values and behavior. However, what is the way to develop this awareness for radical urgent change from the status quo for a person, family, a village, a state, a country, the world? That's, that's, a, that's a big question too. How do we, how do we actually uh, create the uh, awareness for a radical urgent change? change. I think uh, COVID taught us that we can uh, respond to crisis, uh, the immediate physical urgency, right, of COVID sort of taught us that. Now, if we could just see the long term uh, that we're equally at risk and there's no uh, vaccine, what do you think uh, in terms well, of... Well, I think it's a, it's a wonderful question. I think um, it's important to think a little bit about... Um, people in such different circumstances with their social location. Um, so in the environment, the whole field of environmental justice focuses on those who are harmed the most. Um, and in a way, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll say also that my friend from the Church of Sweden, um, Henrik Grappa says that in, in any room where there are decisions made about climate or energy policy, there should be three empty chairs for those who are most impacted and least likely to have a voice. And that should be for the poor and marginalized peoples of the world, for future generations, and for all non-human life. And if you think about it, it's not just that it would be more fair to take them into account, but it's that if we did, we would not be in this situation. So when you take just the poor people living today, um, there are what's known as sacrifice zones where they, 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 they bear a huge burden of the waste and pollution. So one way to wake up to the urgency is to make contact 
um, with people living in what's called EJ communities, environmental justice communities. There is a lot of environmental racism involved in that as well. Making those contacts and, 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 and seeing it from their point of view is one way to get that sense of urgency. And there are places where there's, you know, petrochemical plants in Louisiana in a place they refer to as Cancer Alley, and they're wanting to add another petrochemical plastics plant. And if you listen to the people and their voices in that place, you get that sense of urgency. Um, and otherwise, I would say thinking about that timeline, that, 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 that what are we leaving to our children and grandchildren, no matter what social circumstance you're in, this is going to end up affecting everyone. I would love to introduce you to Marshall Brown, a good friend. I'll, I'll ask you to unmute. And I encourage now the audience to raise your hand and join the conversation. You can raise your hands by going into reactions and, and raise an electronic hand or reach out in the chat. And I see Marshall uh, came to- so, I think I'm good to go. How are you yes. doing? Um, so uh, my question is really, really by way of um, uh, noting what uh, Hilder's done with uh, We Wild uh, Port Washington and how it's proliferated to different communities. I'm, I'm very active here on the South Shore as a, uh, a native planting advocate, and I, I founded an, a nonprofit in really uh, in an area that went for Trump. We got 15,000 people, but they all care about the same thing, which is the Bay. So my question is, shouldn't we be leaning into tribalism just a bit if it's part of human nature and start from, from the grassroots up? Because uh, uh, they don't necessarily want to hear all the top down stuff, but they're ready to get their hands dirty. Thank you so much. That's such a, I, 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 you said a lot there. And I, can, I really think that there's huge value in reconnecting to land and place. And in a way, um, it's it's conservative, right? I mean, it, to conserve uh, traditional ways of relating to land, to think about how, you know, no matter what circumstances we're in, I mean, all of our grandparents and great grandparents didn't live with this fast-paced production and consumption, with a constant kind of, um, you know, divorcing ourselves from. Uh, from nature, um, they lived very differently. So it's 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 a it's a, in that kind of conservative mentality, I think, to sort of say, let's think about traditional ways of relating to land and. Um, well, try and, being try being holed up for a whole year with your yards. People are really reconnecting to their land again. Oh uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that's great. So during COVID, has it has it kind of flourished even more? Uh, yes, when you say Hilder. Yeah, I would say so. Thank you. I, I've, I've noticed uh, much more interest in the land we're on. And, and, and I would just like to, I, I would like to invite who to uh, contribute. Thank you, Marshall. And I will allow you to unmute who's at direct education at the Science Museum. So happy you're here. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, my question is actually education related. Um, so something I've been struggling with is how to properly frame this conversation towards children specifically. Um, how do you think is the best, uh, most effective way of kind of framing this without instilling too much dread in kids and, but also, ex you know, expressing the severity of the situation. And similarly, how can we inspire, um, you know, uh, confidence in our society and the ability for us to kind of turn this around while also holding our society responsible uh, in our role in this when addressing children? Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, that's such a good question. I'd be interested in Hilder's response as well. Um, to, for my part, I would say, um, I think that we should, um, you know, it's very interesting. The youth climate movement was huge uh, last year. It, it got a little bit eclipsed by COVID because, you know, there was a, a focus suddenly on elderly people and protecting protecting those that were older and things, and then Black Lives Matter, things kind of shifted um, and for very good reasons. But, um, but the youth climate movement was so strong so that some of the conversations around like, how do we talk to, about, how do we talk to kids about climate change were sort of reversed where the kids were talking to the adults about climate change saying, yeah. why aren't you doing more, even as young as, you know, 11 and 12. But I think um, still, it, your point is, 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 is very important. How do we take responsibility um, for teaching this in a way that will be um, 
will be effective and responsible. Uh, and I think, you know, one thing about, I think that it's, it's incredible to think about um, what climate change teaches us about the, the interconnectedness of, of, of the world. So if, you know, the ice is melting at the, at the pole and it causes sea level to, to rise, even, you know, even on Long Island, um, it's a, it's, it's kind of a, a it's a terrible kind of beauty, but it's a beautiful um, illustration of how interconnected we are. I actually, one thing I made a note of as I was thinking about, about our conversation tonight was that last summer in June, June 20th, there was a town in Siberia above the Arctic that registered the highest temperature there ever, which was 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit, um, which is amazing in Siberia. And if you think about what we just saw happening in Texas, how weird that was, and people people who are who who want to understand why that happened that that freeze and people froze to death and there was so much un, un people were not prepared. It's partly the poles warming up at a higher rate. They're warming up at two and a half times the poles are the rest of the of the globe, and um, so you get this what what climate scientist Catherine Hayhoe calls global weirding. There's a new a new term, a new, we're shifting language again, um, because it's not just warming, it's the weirding. Mm. But I think that those types of things, when even for, for a young child, to understand the difference between ice and water is just a couple of degrees, and to, and then to apply it to how the world, how the globe functions, I think that is um, there's a lot of, 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 of beauty and fascination in that, um, just the science part. And then if, if we're able to add, um, you know, some, some of the, the parts about how we human beings are connected across space and time, I believe children are actually much more ready for uh, the, the, the depth and the complexity of this topic than adults are. Um, yes. And I've, 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 I always, when working with children, I make sure uh, that we don't um, want to work with the fear. We don't want to feed the fear. We, um, I, I, especially young children, just uh, cultivating the care, the love for Earth, bringing us back to Marshall's, you know, observation that people are ready to rewild because they care for the land they're on. But going with uh, children of all ages, just enjoying being in nature. And if you love something, you may um, become an activist and care for it. You'll you'll make the good. Uh, decisions down the line and I see uh, Lorraine is next so I'm gonna we're gonna keep it going so everybody gets a turn. Lorraine. Thank you. Um, thank you for this uh, powerful talk and um, I just wanted to bring up and and I don't want to kind of <laughs> make it really intense but it already is intense right so I've been studying uh, trauma and the idea of personal trauma, collective trauma, ancestral trauma, and this recognition that this country was built on trauma. And so in these studies, it says that really we're living in a traumatic field already. And then we're having climate change and we're having the pandemic and so many people are already on overwhelm and don't have the skills to deal with um, the overwhelm of it all. And so I know, Hilder, you're a meditation teacher and all of that, and just, just bringing that into the reality of overwhelm with all of this and that people may not have the resources to, to be able to handle the overwhelm that this can create. And how do we, how do, we do that, you know, how do we bring these you know, practices more so that people can have resources to, to, to be able to not freeze and um, to be able to take action. Because I think that's the thing, we need to be in action, but if people are freeze, feeling frozen or mm -hmm. overwhelmed, it's, it's, it's too much and then they don't take action. Yeah. And especially like in marginalized communities where they've had the most trauma and then they really don't have the resources and the knowledge of how to deal with their own trauma to be able to act. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. I, 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 that's very powerful and I think um, astute. Uh, I, um, one of the things that, um, that I uh, 
learned in reading a little bit about trauma and thinking about it is that one of the most important um, things for healing is is connection, connection with other people to to repair trust um, and and to stop that kind of isolation um, and and frozenness, uh, the sort of fight flight um, instinct. <clears throat> and I actually think that the connection with nature and there is there is some uh, now research to bear this out is very very healing and powerful for for this traumatic time um, and. Uh, you know, there, there are examples of where um, there are studies, the, the, the Heart, American Heart Association and so on, um, have done to show that, uh, that there, there's actually like really serious health benefits to immersing yourself in nature and connecting to nature. And again, you know, to go back to the GDP uh, conversation, why is that not valued more? Well, nobody makes money off of it, right? I mean, you, some people might characterize that as a conversation about capitalism. I think we can be more specific. You know, there are ways to reform capitalism and not let it dominate all of our lives. Um, and just understand that to protect natural spaces and to nourish our culture. So there's a you know, term biocultural heritage that I learned from, from some indigenous colleagues, um, which is about, you know, to not separate nature and culture, but to bring them together. Um, and that that is a form of healing um, and particularly when people come together across generational lines, across all kinds of lines, to protect and enjoy that that natural connection together. But your point about the trauma um, is is very important. And, and Hilda, you might have something to add to to that response. Yes, I I I want to welcome Lorraine to join the Transition Town community as well. We're 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 good friends. Uh, Lorraine works in the permaculture movement, so I think being in community as communing as we um, really battle with this uh, state of things as it is. But it's better to think, see things as they are. You know, Al Gore has the climate reality project. You know, it's a reality, right? And, and what do we do with the reality? We, you know, we, we, it's, it brings us to those stages of grief. There is a um, stage of denial and and not wanting to see the problem, but then you see the problem. And once you're uh, closer to the solution, so this series, I, I want to be about climate solutions. We want to uplift each other in community as we think of different solutions. And Karenna, I have a question from Ryan Madden, who I don't think is here tonight. He emailed his question, but if you're here, Ryan, maybe you want to reach out. Because there are practical things and legislative changes we can make in, in, uh, in becoming the change we want to see. There's already a cultural shift. Just, you know, a few years ago, we wouldn't have over 100 people on the line speaking about uh, the climate crisis. So there's a, there has this shift is already there. And it, it's said that we only need 3% to, you know, cause a significant shift. Ryan Madden asks... Uh, New York Renews recently released a new report detailing five false solutions that the gas industry puts forward to seem clean and green, but in reality are just as dirty as their fossil fuel counterparts. These include biofuels, biomass energy, green hydrogen, and waste to energy. Some of these false solutions have already been raised by groups advocating for the low carbon fuel standard in the New York state legislature and by polluters at the federal level. So um, he wants you to comment on the danger of these solutions and offer suggestions for how everyday people can combat the ongoing disinformation campaign waged by the fossil fuel industry. Yes, uh, well, thank you for that question. Very. Um very important and thorough. Um, and I, I wanna say uh, that all of us living in New York State um, should recognize the incredible work of this coalition of, um, of you know, I, I almost don't wanna say the word activist because it has certain connotations. Some people are activists, some people are concerned citizens, some people are just um, really in, it's a matter of civic engagement um, on this on this problem. But in any event, the New York Renews coalition of groups has really pushed uh, uh, policy solutions in a very effective way so that we have this, this law, the Climate Leadership Community Protection Act, um, 
which is, uh, which is, I, I think you can say the most ambitious um, an effective law in the country now statewide, which not only um, gets us to a place of carbon neutrality um, by 2050, I believe it is, but also makes sure that a th about a third um, uh, of, of, of the investment goes to frontline communities, those who are impacted the most by pollution and, and need the most help. So the question is, how do we stop these false solutions and the industry's um, voice from uh, watering this down and um, impeding the necessary pro uh, progress? And first of all, I will say, um, I think we're in a much better position today than we were certainly a year ago, right? Um, there has, there's been a lot of uh, not just sort of righteous indignation, um, but actual power um, from environmental justice groups and communities. There's real political power um, now uh, that that these communities can, can wield. And you can see that in how the new administration took shape. Um, it's not just that um, that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris had all of the right, you know, ideas and convictions, although, you know, I give them credit. It's also that the movement had been built. Um, people had, had, had reached the level of, of consciousness and awareness and readiness with these arguments um, and not taking the usual uh, bait from the industry. Um, and so I think we're in a much better position now to say, um, to, 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 to blow the whistle on falsehoods. It's no time for half measures. It's now or never. We can always point to those IPCC reports, the International Panel on Climate Change, about how urgent this is. And we now have not only the Paris Agreement to point to, um, which the US is now back in, right? As of just what, a couple of weeks ago, um, officially, but also the, the New York State climate law. And in order to meet those standards, we have to be um, uh, dispensing with the half measures and the false solutions. And we can also point out that they have a, a long history of misinformation. Um, and so, you know, I mean, we, we have the, 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 the kind of extreme versions like the Exxon New story where we, we can see where they really covered up and did complete like fraud, really fraudulent um, PR materials. Um, which has, which really have 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 has had a devastating effect on on our our culture's ability to grapple with this, and we won't put up with that anymore. So I think pointing to the past about how we saw what happened, we're not going to let it happen again, and the future in that we're going to meet the Paris Agreement and the the standards of the CLCPA um, are are both good ways to to not let um, those uh, those falsehoods be uh, continued. Yes, and, and that means, you know, new development, any kind of new setting higher standards for, you know, and, and that, you know, decarbonizing the power grid seems like an obvious first step to take. We will next, uh, in two weeks, we'll meet and talk about regenerative agriculture that is a reform to the industrial agricultural complex. And our third uh, Thursday, that's um, going to be on a Plastic Fools Day. It's April Fools. We're calling yeah. it. We're calling it. We've been we've been uh, fooled by the plastic industry as well. That's very much, uh, you know, allied with uh, the fossil fuel industry as petrochemicals. And it's very interesting to me that often people think that natural gas is natural, and not knowing the damage that fracking does to the environment. You know, the the misinformation is is what we need to correct with education. And that's why groups like Transition Town, you know, step into action. And I want to hear Blanca. Blanca, please um, unmute. We, I recognize we're at an hour, but um, we will stay over time if you're okay with that, Karana. Uh, I'm okay with it. Good, thank you. Hi, Hildur. My friend, thank you so much. Um, what a pleasure, Karina, to meet you. Um, I have to say that I, I was honored to have met your dad back in 1996 at the um, Summit of the Americas. I was at the time working on my thesis and actually it was in economic development based on sustainability. And at the time, it was very difficult to convince even my own professors because it was just like a dream. How could you think of this in the future? And 
And I was the top student in my school and I was able to speak at this summit where your dad actually brought over and opened that conversation about ending poverty and creating you know, clean water and clean air for, for the world. And that stuck with me ever since. And my, I, I finished my thesis. And um, ever since, I've been a huge advocate and activist uh, trying to help um, promote and making you know friends, family, and people, whoever can listen, that this is real. You know, and climate change is real. And in fact, back in 2019, we uh, in Bolivia, um, for two straight months, we had, you know, the, the fires, the burning of the lands we, we lost. Uh, it was a biocide, we call it the biocide. Uh, I got to speak at UN September of 2019, uh, bringing up, you know, everything that was happening there and how the government was not paying attention, was not doing anything. In fact, the solution they, the government made was to legalize uh, deforestation which caused this huge damage in this huge hole in the Amazonas, which is, you know, collides, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's, it's in the border of Bolivia and Brazil. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, um, I'm, I just wanted to ask you um, if you know or how anyone, we can continue to create um, grassroots programs you know, at a small level, but, you know, trying to impact from a uh, global and macro, per, you know, perspective in order to fight something that is so real that we're living day in and day out. We have started three years ago with a team of friends through an or uh, a movement called Plastic or No Gracias, which is Plastic No Thank You. We are up to like 200,000 people and we try to create community and we try to, uh, you know, see how, how can we utilize all our garbage and how we, we can recycle our own garbage, you know, and try to uh, be up to, you know, UN, uh, you know, 2030 agenda. So if there's anything, any advice, any programs that you know, uh, how can we as community, you know, one person, you know, you know, cannot do it all, but you know, one person thank everywhere you. can do a lot. Yes, thanks, Blanca. Thank you, thank you so much. I I, I appreciate your kind words about my father. Um, and you know, I've also learned from him, obviously. So when you say that, it, it actually makes me think of myself because I didn't, I really didn't expect to go into this kind of work myself. But sometimes, when I'm talking, I, I, I know his voice is in my head saying just like what you heard him say back then was what I was hearing him say back then. So um, so thank you for that. And just for anybody who's interested in a, in a climate reality training, there is another one coming up. It's a virtual one. And Center for Earth Ethics is going to work on a faith track in that climate reality training. So if you know any mid-career faith leaders, we're especially interested in having them apply and then they can work some with the Center for Earth Ethics people. So go to the Climate Reality Project. It's actually April 22nd to May 2nd, just to say if people are interested in that training. And then in answer to your um, question, you know, I, it's a very big question and I wanna be sure I get it right in terms of, of, of when you say we, and maybe Hilder, you can help me in reframing um, because I, I know it is so daunting. And when you're saying our community, are you talking about the community in Long Island or are you talking about a different community? Sorry. Yes, no, definitely working, you know, from Long Island. And um, it'll be so amazing if we could model what we do here locally to bring to Central America and South America. That was the focus of your dad, actually, at the Summit of the Americas, in okay. order to help end poverty. So anything that we can do here uh, that we have, you know, more resources than, uh, and we are more advanced in certain areas than we have you know, perhaps more education, more more knowledge, you know, if we could model something that we can bring to countries that, you know, don't have access to certain resources. Oh, and those resources. I think I got, thank you so much. Uh, I think I think I got a little bit better now. And I will say, first of all, that um, in some, and I, under, I understand that um, 
that uh, um, in in a lot of ways there is this this kind of advancement, and particularly in the past years, um, around you know educational models and technologies and solutions and so on. But I'm also very impressed by traditional indigenous cultures in Central and South America, and ha have had the opportunity to be um, to learn a little bit from from them. And I would say we have a lot to learn about um, earth ethics from uh, traditional indigenous uh, peoples who um, are relating to place, you know, in conversation with the place that they're in. And I don't mean to overly romanticize this. I know that, you know, you can't, you know, stereotype people, but I have I have seen um, and and heard and learned from some teachers in, from cultures where the conversation that they're having with the forest and uh, and the way that people that that they think about the environment is just very different. We we're trained from such a young age in this country to think about this as just a dead, flat, inanimate set of resources around us that doesn't have any personality or volition or agency of its own. It's just here for us to use. And if it's not being turned into a product or used as a dumping ground, there's nothing happening there. I mean, it's a little bit of an exaggeration, but um, I, I really um, think that the shift in perception is very important to start to see, you know, the theologian, um, um, who I admire uh, said that um, the universe is not a collection of objects, but is a um, communion of subjects. Why am I forgetting his name? Um, anyway, so I, I, I think that earth ethics, as I, I think that there's a huge opportunity to do basic education um, in the, the essentially like, when you turn on your water, where does it come from? You know, when you turn on the light, where does the electricity come from? Um, there's so many things that we don't know. Even myself telling my children, um, it's not easy to say these basic questions about earth ethics that I, I think are very important and connect us immediately to, you know, watersheds rivers, um, suddenly the world opens up and we see how we're connected by simply understanding our most basic needs. When we flush the toilet, where does it, where does it go? Um, and, and so on. I think that if we could design, to, to go back to your essential point, if we here who have, you know, not only do we have the resources, but we also have the predicament. Do you know what I mean? Like we're seeing our predicament right now. And if we can really grapple with that and then design a kind of module of, of education and workshop, a workshop, um, and then package it so that we can then share it with the world, we're in this situation now with technology where we can do that so well. Um, and I think that there is, there's great opportunity to then bring the best of both worlds, which is some of that traditional knowledge and the kind of wherewithal to see it on a systemic level and what the solutions are. So I, I hope that that makes some sense and thank you. Yeah, thanks, Karen. And I want to really get to uh, Jesse is here and three sister Rebecca Lefton and my friend David Yakim. So I think we'll have to wrap the questions after that. But if everyone could keep uh, their um, uh, contribution uh, to the point and because we I know we could speak for many hours, but I want to be respectful of your time and, and that we have you here. Thank you. Uh, before just a Practical note, we will compile any action items. Guy uh, Jacobs shared very useful links, uh, action items in the chat. I will save the chat and I'll be sending a document after this meeting to everyone who is here. And Helper, I just remembered the name of that theologian. It's Thomas Berry, sorry. I, yes. He's driving me crazy, I couldn't remember his name. I love that guy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and 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 it's it's just such a pleasure to be here with you. We welcome you to be part of our extended community, and look forward to come to the Center for Earth Ethics. But let's uh, move on to Jesse, uh, and then Rebecca and David, and then cap the questions at that point. Well, thank you. Hi, um, thank you, Hilda and Karina. What a wonderful um, event and discussion, and I'm inspired by folks. Um, and thanks to Rebecca for inviting me into this discussion. Um, I'm curious, you know, I'm thinking about our current COVID crisis um, and the climate crisis. Um, and on the one hand, we have had this experience where we've seen culture shift quickly. Um, but 
I am d dismayed by it. Um, and, and I feel like one lesson of it is the sort of unrelenting um, logic of sort of production, um, the sense that we have to keep on working um, and, the, and the massive inequality and sort of massive di upsetting disparity in the impact of deaths. Um, and so I guess I'm curious also based on your experience thinking about the civil rights movement, thinking about spirituality, um, what has this taught you about the tactics that we might employ in addressing the climate crisis so that it's not as, you know, so, so that we can avoid some of the devastation? Yeah, thank you. Well, there, was a, there was a lot that you just said there that, that resonates with me. I, I, I think um, when I was answering the, you know, the previous question, I was talking about we understand we're in a predicament. That's part of the predicament that we're in, I think, you know, it's kind of, you know, a lot of people are sort of looking at the expectations of, of work and what that means. And it doesn't always match up with meaningful life and with the things that people value the most, like, you know, having a, a family and a community and a culture that we feel proud of. Um, and we, we, there are disparities, of course, economically. There are people that are working several jobs, barely making ends meet. We have to change that. Um, and, and there's a whole set of, you know, political um, uh, there's agendas around that, minimum wage and so on. Um, but also just how do we, um, how do we, how do we reorder uh, the, the values collectively um, so that um, so that we have that well-being, uh, and we can look to other countries that it seems like they're doing a better a better job. I do like to look at indigenous uh, traditional indigenous cultures because I just feel that from what I've experienced in some places and from some people, there's a real wisdom there that, of course, there's also, someone spoke about trauma earlier, there's also quite a lot of trauma. So to keeping that in mind, you know, usually. But I think, um, for example, um, okay, 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity is in the hands of indigenous people, okay? And then some people will say that um, where the highest, I've heard, I heard a, somebody say a statistic the other day, a very well-meaning person talking about development was saying the places with the highest biodiversity are, is also the place with the highest poverty. And I thought, I, you know, I don't know about how they're measuring poverty there because I've also heard from traditional indigenous peoples, they're told they're living in poverty if in fact the forest is your hospital, your church, your grocery store, um, everything. Uh, you're told that that's poverty because it's not a cash economy. But in fact, that is, uh, uh, in, in, in the voices of these traditional people, incredible wealth and well-being. So how do we change our development model to take account of that so that we ourselves can understand the incredible wealth that is involved in a shared forest in in having food that we can um collect in the wild uh and and so on um so that's one thing is to is to try to do, i think do the educational um place because like we were saying before children are educated out of knowing that um and so to to shift the priorities in education is very important and then in terms of the tactics of the climate movement i think the end of your question was a little bit different about from the civil rights movement um about the climate movement, if I'm if, if I'm if I'm remembering it correctly, and of course we already talked about nonviolent civil disobedience. That's one thing, but there's also drawing from um, from uh, sacred texts and teachings, spirituality, moral language. It does not have to be overtly religious. It doesn't have to be religious in the sense of doctrine, certainly. Um, but when there is a deeply resonant chord maybe it's a poem um uh but maybe it's a bible verse you can touch people in on a deeper level about um about the motivation and you can bring people together across those uh partisan lines political lines and i think we can see that when we look back at the civil rights movement when we hear those words from primarily from King, but certainly from others, um, we can see how that just took it to another level. It was no longer the political thing about states' rights and states' rights and, and, and the kind of uh, 
uh, practicalities of the political systems of ending de of ending segregation. It was a moral question. And I think where we are now on the climate thing is to just take it to that other level, protect our culture, shift our education. And there's so much more. Uh, Hilder, did you want to add anything to that answer? I, I'm completely there with you. I, I mean, this is, and the conversation, I would like to add, there's so many, Carol had uh, really good remarks and questions and we can't get to everything right now. Something will be pushed over to the next uh, conversation, but we will also be having a conversation, uh, not live, but in, uh, by email after the fact. And we'll be sharing a document uh, for those who have to leave the call before we lose um, the participants will share um, the thoughtful questions and perhaps uh, um, our thoughts as a community here, the transition town um, view on that. And I'd love to have uh, my three sister, Rebecca, I'm going to unmute you. Thank Re you. Reforesting the tropics. That's yeah. And I know Jesse from my time in Washington, D.C., where we were working on climate change at the federal and global level. And we were both in Paris where we met your dad, Karina, <laughs> together. Right. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's nice circles coming together. And so I really appreciate the way that you have beautifully spoken about environmental justice and supporting indigenous peoples and recognizing what is sacred. And um, March is Women's History Month and in four days it's going to be International Women's Day. And so I was wondering if you could speak to the role of women in climate change and um, perhaps how you see the connection between patriarchy and oppression um, as well as the domination of the earth and women. Yes, yes, thank you. Oh, thank you so much. For that, I um, there 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 are several levels to this. I definitely think that there uh, is a connection between um, domination of the earth and domination of of, of the feminine and 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 females. Um, and um, there are uh, there there are many levels to this. I think some of it has to do with um, the thought system that came from this kind of marriage of colonization and Christianity. So I don't want to go on too long about it, but just to briefly say that, um, you know, we are living in a circumstance um, in which the, the, the presence of your European uh, peoples on this land. So my ancestors, uh, certainly, and um, uh, many of us, of course, came under different circumstances and so on. But um, the, the initial presence was a kind of uh, theological claim um, that there was a mandate uh, from the Bible um, to conquer, vanquish, and subdue in the name of Christianity and Christendom this land. And, and there was the Vatican issued these papal bulls, they were called announcing that, the age of Columbus and the explorers and so on. And it applied to Africa and the Americas. And so that is, I think, explains a lot in terms of, 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 of the, the, the joint um, root causes, in some cases, of ecological devastation and racism. Because it was said that the, the, the people who were non-Christian in the Americas were part of the flora and fauna, and also in Africa, part of the flora and fauna, rather than being human beings. Okay, so, um, but to back up, the, the Emperor Constantine converted to Christianity in the fourth century, and um, there was, uh, in that instance, of course, the essence of Christianity wasn't made up of this sort of domination paradigm of, of empire, but it was, it was very much uh, instilled as a kind of partnership. And the first place that was colonized that way was in Europe. Um, and a lot of the keepers of the traditional indigenous spirituality were women. Um, so there was, you know, we've all heard about witch burnings, um, in, in Europe at that time. And the, the stamping out of the sacred feminine definitely happened. And it definitely happened in conjunction with a kind of hierarchical um, male, you know, it was the Vatican, um, based kind of on the, in the Roman army, you know, kind of aligned together. And um, 
So instead of seeing the forest as sacred, where there are ceremonies along the river and the springs and so on, um, there was a no, it's only sacred if the priest says it is and blesses it, and it's all in a male hierarchical line. So it's just the way it happened that the sense of, of the sacred being stamped out of nature happened in conjunction with the sense of, of women could no longer be the holders of, of, of sacred ceremonies and so on. There's also just in terms of the, I'm sorry to go on so long, but the Latin root is so interesting. Mater, you know, M-A-T-E-R is the same as mother and the same as matter. And some people will talk about the, the, the whole concept of dualism, that's, that spirit and matter are separate, right? Yes. That, um, and, and so that also, I think, has to do with um, making everything feminine associated with matter, associated with earth and lesser than. And so in this time of Women's History Month, and we can see so many, so many women in it. And, and, and I think, I, I think we need both. We need balance, you know, we, we, there's a sacred masculine too, but there's a sacred feminine. And so to have, um, and of course, non-binary, absolutely. It's, there's so much mystery involved, but I think that it's very, it's very notable that there are many women of all ages who are coming forward speaking um, now for the environment, um, for the climate. And it's, it's a beautiful, uh, I think, epic course correction um, that's happening. Yes. And, and I want to be uh, respectful of everyone's time. I do, I do recognize that we're getting close to the end. So I just want to share a few practical um, uh, slides. But one uh, of my uh, teachers, Joanna Macy, she wrote this, that if the world is to be healed through human efforts, I'm convinced it will be by ordinary people, people whose love for this life is even greater than their fear. And in terms of reframing the climate crisis, that's why we're still here. I can't believe we still have 90 people or 80 something on the call tonight. And that's how much you care. And thank you. I, I really want to acknowledge that. Uh, and, and that's how we're going to win this fight because we care, because we care for earth and each other. And, and and we don't have to have the same skin tone to, you know, care. And, and we can care for each other, something that is the, really the indigenous view, caring across time and space, caring for future beings, caring for your family. And we've learned a lot in COVID. I would like to lead you to the regeneration revolution that will be on Thursday, March 18th. That is uh, uh, my answer uh, and Transition Town's answer to uh, climate destruction in terms of uh, so soil erosion. I think it is the way. I think our, um, you know, leadership has to acknowledge that the industrial agricultural complex is sick and needs healing. And I think regenerative methods are now coming into play and will break free from plastic, at least single use. There's a lot of behavioral changes ahead. So there are... Um, you know, to, tonight we've been blessed with getting to the moral and ethical, um, the motivation for being here and how uh, I've heard an indigenous leader, uh, Ghost Horse, Tio Cousin Ghost Horse, I think he said, you can't burn out if you go to earth. You know, and he, of a, a nate, that's an indigenous wisdom. If we're serving earth, earth is abundant. There is so much oxygen in the room with me right now, thanks to the living beings breathing with us. And we'll be going into legislation and the, uh, I really urge you to um, encourage you to visit our uh, link here in the corner. You can see the bit.ly link that you can, uh, sign up for all these different or whatever interests you because we're always going to be best at what we're passionate about. And so I, I really want to thank you, Karen. I, I know we said an hour, but we always go into overtime. <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank, you. 
<laughs> I want to thank you and I want to thank the audience. So many wonderful questions. And I did see in the in the chat people responding with some um, with some comments about uh, the stewardship in the Bible and the story of the fall. And I want to say that um, I completely agree. It's so wonderful to be able to go back. And I, I don't want to characterize Christianity in a bad way by telling the story of the of the of the the, the marriage of Christianity and empire. So just to acknowledge that in the chat that I, I, I do agree. And, and thank you for pointing that out. And just to say thank you to all of you and to you, Hilder, and to our wonderful hosts. <laughs> and thank you, Karina. Can can we take one last question? Oh, sure. Just uh, because I, my friend David is here with yes, his hi. Can you can make you it? Uh, hi, hi, David. We can take our conversation offline at another time, but uh, I wanted to acknowledge that your hand was raised. So well, thank you. Yeah. And we keep the time. Sure. So sea levels are rising multiple feet. Here in Port Washington, we're in a coastal region. We anticipate losing most of our salt marshes and beaches this century. At the same time, right now, we're spending billions of dollars in the planning process on infrastructure to protect ourselves from the rising seas. The walls we're erecting they're fragment, are fragmenting our upland habitats from our wetlands. How can we, as a coastal town and community, ensure that uh, we protect and conserve our salt marshes and beaches that we're losing, and that this is part of the planning process as we are erect, erecting walls from the sea right now. Mm -hmm. And Port Washington, we, are, we have a Save Our Shorelines movement, and we, want, we would like to um, be part of a larger conversation and action on this. Yeah. Yeah, they, there might be, I'm sure there are people who who have, uh, who have know more about this than I do, who are here, who could answer it better. But I would say for myself that um, making people aware and inviting them to be concerned together, exactly what you're doing right now, building a community that can spread that awareness and um, and come together because that that feels like like really good love to me loving your place loving your land loving the way that it nurtures um our human health and and our childhood memories and our our dreams of of how we'll grow old in peace and happiness and, and everything that makes life meaningful and valuable so it seems to me like you have a very powerful case to make. The only thing is for most of these things, people aren't paying enough attention, um, I think, in terms of, of how these projects come in that, that ignore the natural ecosystem and get put in. So I would say that what you're doing now, bringing the community together is 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 great. I, from my perspective, I work, uh, I'm on the board of Riverkeeper the, about the Hudson River. So I've heard, you know, a lot about the the, the proposal that was out there for, for a giant seawall. Um, and, uh, and, and which would kill the Hudson River, of course, because it flows both ways. And so that's a conversation that you just reminded me of. People need to understand the laws of nature and how nature works and that we're a part of it. Um, and also need to stop acting like we're just at the effect of things and understand that we're at the cause. You know, if we are in a cause and effect situation, let's be at the level of cause and not just have, oh, let's build another huge wall. No, let's mm. change at the level of cause so we don't need the huge wall. Exactly. And then let's do the solutions that are more in balance and keeping with nature. So Hilder, did you have anything to add? Yes, as, as our best defense for uh, rising uh, sea levels is uh, planting native of plants, uh, deep rooted, um, really actually not developing uh, at the waterfront in terms of cement. Um, and that's uh, something, a passing project of mine is to try to educate that your best defense is not going to be in a brick or cement. It's going to be in intelligent. Uh, and aquaculture actually is something that we can use to clean up the bay. Uh, regenerative aquaculture with uh, seaweed and kelp and, 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 and putting up our defenses, intelligent defenses in, that are natural defenses against erosion and rising sea levels uh, make much more sense to me. Salt marshes are uh, incredible at capturing carbon, carbon sequestration. So protecting really the shoreline and, and, and protecting our salt marshes, I think, is an action item. 
that we need to look at as from transition towns perspective and and it's almost nine o'clock and i really want to you know we could go on for a long time but i, I want to make sure we end now and and as we say uh, let's transition together i'm going to send everyone who is here an email with our information because um I think, you know, an hour and a half is a lot to ask and I want to keep everyone coming back. Um, so thank you for your time and attention here tonight. And uh, I hope to see you back in two weeks. We're going to be meeting every other Thursday, wrapping around. Um, so the, I think our last time to meet here is April 29th. That's Thursday after Earth Day. So this is our way of celebrating Earth Day. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you.